What's going on, everybody? This is Clint. You may know me from the Die Hard MMA podcast over on Pub Sports Radio. I am being joined by my guy Cody Zafdik from the Mayo Media Network, the Fight Network. You guys uh, know both of our faces probably pretty well at this point. We're pretty excited to come to talk to you and give a betting breakdown for Aries MMA. They've got an awesome card coming up this weekend. Cody's going to be joining me. I actually was the line setter for these fights and uh, we're going to give you a little bit of preview as to why I set the lines where I did and then Cody's going to break the fights down for you and give you a little bit of betting advice give a pick maybe let you know uh, where you should be steering as far as placing your money on these fights on Saturday Cody how you doing today man very good man I've always been really intrigued by this idea on one hand you got the lines maker on the other hand you got the capper and it's just a really cool little uh intriguing little spot to have both sides of the argument right so I'd love to hear your reasoning for why you set them this way and then I'm going to give you my reasoning for why I'm going to play a certain side I love it it's going to be fun man it's a fun exercise for both of us and this is a really cool card coming up everybody the main event and the co-main event absolutely have some familiar names for you so let's go ahead and jump right on in first fight of the night is going to be Trevor Peak taking on Kama Worthy. And you may know Kama Worthy. He's had a stint in the UFC, made it to the top of MMA in the game today. Trevor Peak, however, a really highly touted prospect, a 5-0 and undefeated young fighter making his way through the scene here. I set this line, Cody, maybe a little disrespectful to Kama Worthy, but that is probably because of the hype surrounding Trevor Peak. What I've got right now, comma worthy, as you saw in the graphic, there is a minus 225 favorite. Trevor Peak, the 180 underdog here. What I saw from Trevor Peak is that this kid is made out of iron and he hits like a truck. Now, comma worthy, I do believe, is the more skilled martial artist. He's going to have a reach advantage here. If he uh, minds his P's and Q's, I think he probably can win this fight. However, we've seen him knocked out on the regional scene before. We've seen him hurt by big power punchers. And if Trevor Peak is anything like some of the other guys, comma worthy's fought, If he can take some of that early finesse, work his way into the fight, land a big shot, I can see him winning this fight. It's a quote-unquote puncher's chance, if you will, uh, but I do think that I needed to account for the fact that we've seen Kama Worthy in this spot before where he has been hurt. So what do you think of the line, and where would you end up on this fight? Yeah, so I think it's a dangerous fight because you got both guys that are striker first. If you're looking at uh, just the skill set, Kama Worthy seems to have just the skill set, right? He seems to be a little more refined with his striking. His kickboxing is a little tighter. His technique's a little bit better. He's got excellent hand speed. He's fought at a higher level. He's got the experience. And then low key, BJJ Brown Belt. Guy's not bad on the ground at all. Of course, he has a guillotine choke over Luis Pena in the UFC. And you see when he's at his best, he's very well-rounded. I always liken him to the actual Death Star, which is his nickname. The thing is just an offensive beast. It's a juggernaut. But how can it be defeated? Well, if you can hit the exhaust port with a proton torpedo, the whole thing just crumbles. And in his case, that's exactly it. Nine pro losses, all nine pro losses inside the distance, eight of which would have come by knockout. At 55, there's too much speed. The guys are going to connect. And of course, a guy like Trevor Peak, as you mentioned, an absolute truck of a man comes at you at all times. And for that reason, I mean, even though Common Worthy is the more skillful guy and skill generally wins out, it's a durability thing. Now, you and I, time and time out, every week talk about puncher's chance. This guy's got a puncher's chance. Every fight that has ever happened there's a puncher's chance, right? David beat Goliath on the basis of a puncher's chance. Of course, he brought a slingshot for the record. It can <laughs> happen, but it's it's even more so when one of the guys has got a tremendous amount of power, and it's even more so when one guy has got a suspect chin. And in this case, you got Trevor Peak with a tremendous amount of power and comma worthy with potentially a suspect chin. Someone's going down. I got the under one and a half. You you set that line accordingly, I believe. Um, but I would have to go with Trevor Peak. He's young, he's hungry, he's strong, he's training the best that he's ever had. Meanwhile, Common Worthy, 35 years old. Of course, he has that wear and tear. He just opened up his new gym. It's not a it's not a desire. It's not a does he want to compete. I'm sure he does. It's just at some point he's gonna get hit by Trevor Peak. And at that point, I, I don't know what happens. Okay. The under one and a half, as you mentioned, I did set accordingly, man. We got minus two fifty on the under one <laughs> yeah, and a half. Yeah. Regardless of who wins this fight, I don't expect it to last very long. That's just kind of what Common Worthy does. We We've seen it time and time again. We don't know what it looks like when Trevor Peak loses. So some questions surrounding that one, but I kind of feel like whoever wins this one very likely gets it done early. So if you think Trevor Peak, you know, gets some time in the cage and, you know, actually works his way into a fight a little bit, maybe the plus money on the over one and a half will entice you. Personally, I don't think it's going to get there. So I said it pretty heavily chalked to the under. And like I said, 
I had to respect the back class of comma worthy. I had to respect the level of competition. Totally understand the dog shot here on Trevor Peak. And I don't think you'll be alone, man. I think there's going to be a lot of locals that'll join you on that Trevor Peak dog shot here on Saturday. The co-main event, very much like the main event, is a similar setup. It's a UFC caliber fighter, someone who we've seen in these bigger organizations taking on another absolute stud coming up here for Aries. We've got Robbie Ring taking on Jacob Kilburn. And much like how I set the line with Kama Worthy, I have to respect what Jacob Kilburn has been through. I have to respect where he's been, what he's done. So I've got him at minus 190, the comeback on Robbie Ring at plus 155. The thing that concerns me just a little bit about Robbie Ring is, I talked about this at the end of my show when I did my betting preview for this one, he hasn't really fought anybody. He's one of these kids that seems to check all the boxes. It looks like he's got the goods. We're pretty damn sold on Trevor Peak. I've still got a couple questions about Robbie Ring. So this is going to be a real test here for him. But the other part that kind of concerns me is where Jacob Kilburn is at right now in his career. If I'm being honest with you, Cody, he seems like he's almost in full slide mode right now going into this fight. Uh, we've heard some struggles coming in about the weight cut, seeing whether or not he's going to be motivated to actually make the weight for this one, things of that nature. I've got my concerns. I had to set this line relatively competitively, but I also absolutely had to respect the case. Jacob Kilburn on his best night probably still deserves to be the favorite here. So I've got minus 190 on Jacob Kilburn, plus 155 coming back on Robbie Ring. I did set the total here at two and a half. I do think this fight probably finishes inside the distance, but we have seen Jacob Kilburn work that grappling and go over in his fights before. So it's a pretty competitive line under two and a half, minus 140, over two and a half, plus 125. What do you think about the betting odds here, Cody? And uh, how do you see this fight playing out? Yeah, another fun fight. This one I would agree with in the sense that Robbie Ring really hasn't fought nobody. I mean, he's fought a couple guys that had two fights to their credit. Uh, so very difficult to jump from someone who has a one and one record or a one and two record to jumping in against Jacob Kilburn, who, of course, you know, has 14 pro fights, has fought in the UFC, he's been there, done that. Uh, it, it's a bit of a jump. Jacob Kilburn, though, you're right. At one point in his career, promising talent. He's got some legitimate wins on the regional scene, a couple wins over Elvin Brito, beat Edward Massey. He was probably on his way to developing. But he just got throttled into this opportunity to fight on the Contender Series and then fight on the UFC. And I think it has broken down his confidence. I think it has mentally shook him a little bit. He's still at American Top Team. He's still at one of the best gems in the country. But he's coming off a bad loss in the regional scene and where he broke his forearm against Luca, Lucas Alexander. He's had six months off. There's not a whole lot of footage out there with, for Robbie Ring. And so this is do or die for him. If he comes in and loses to a 22-year-old unheralded kid and, and then moves this to a five-fight losing streak, you know, his back's up against the wall. Whereas Robbie Ring is just a career martial artist. Both of his parents are martial artists. He's been doing martial arts since he was, you know, basically since he was born. I think it was some time he was three years old. And uh, like you mentioned, he checks off all the boxes. He can strike. He can grapple. He's composed. He's got good cardio. He's, again, one of these kids that the sport is trending towards, these young athletic kids that get a quick jump on it. Whereas Kilburn, he's still only 27, but he's fallen into that journeyman role. And so I don't disagree with the line because of the experience that Kilburn has. But I think Kilburn's been able to showcase that he can fight against good guys and get beat up. Whereas Robbie Ring, you've not seen him get beat up. I can understand it. I can understand it. I feel like I'd be doing a, a massive disservice if these lines were any closer than I set them. But I'll be honest with you, Cody, I've got massive concerns about both these favorites, which is why they're not coming in here at minus 450, minus 600, like you would expect to see somebody with UFC caliber experience taking a step down to the regional scene. Uh, like you mentioned earlier, I fully expect to see Robbie Ring and Trevor Peak more than likely on the Contender Series maybe in the UFC, maybe in Bellator, the PFL, sooner than later. So I think these are rising stars. I think these are legit prospects, and I'm really excited to see how they can perform in front of their hometown crowds uh, at this fight card here on Saturday. Absolutely. All right. Now we're moving right along down the card here. We have got Charleston Poo taking on Zachary Hicks. And what we've got is a very, very closely lined fight here from me. These guys are two that uh, I had to do a little bit of research on. I didn't know a, a ton about leading into uh, these fights when I was getting ready to go here. And what we've got is, you know, <sighs> Charleston is a BJJ uh, purple belt. All right. 
He's going to be a bit smaller here in this spot. I feel like he's a bit more skilled of the two, but that size disadvantage is something that we've seen come back and haunt these guys. Zachary Hicks, uh, he's a wrestler. On, I understand he's a high school wrestling coach. Solid on the ground. BJJ purple belt himself. His striking leaves a little bit to be desired in my opinion, so that's where I think Pooh can definitely have a little bit of an edge here. But I can also see that wrestling background really driving Zachary Hicks to going ahead and uh, getting himself back in this fight, potentially getting a win, cage control, cage time. This thing was close to a pick em, but I did have to go ahead and favor Charleston Pooh. I think he's got a slightly higher ceiling, and I think he's got a slightly more developed game at this point. What do you think about this one, Cody? Yeah, I went with Hicks. Hicks I'm familiar with. He fights for areas quite a bit, and he's going to have that local support of the crowd. He's from Nashville MMA. And again, I just I love these guys that have that wrestling base and are able to go out there and grind, especially taking on a guy like Charleston Pooh. Yes, BJJ Purple Belt, but he's one and two as a pro boxer. And as of late, he's been kind of spending his time in the pro boxing realm. So I fully expect him to have a striking advantage over Hicks. But if you got a striker versus grappler matchup, I den tend to favor personally on the grappling side of things. Hicks, meanwhile, I'll give the guy one thing. He goes uh, to South Carolina and loses uh, to Lutra Colic. That's his first uh, pro loss, right? He goes out there, takes on a guy that's from Stephen Thompson's camp in South Carolina, loses. Then he goes and takes on Guy Curry in Georgia. Guy Curry, one of the top regional scene guys, in Georgia. And of course, Reginald Adams for the CFFC organization, every time Hicks loses is when he steps out, out of his comfort zone and goes and fights the best guys available to him, right? Now he's fighting at home. He's going to have that crowd behind him. He's going to have that grind. He's come back. Uh, he had a two-year long layoff, had some work done to his knee, came back against Corey Delaney, shook off some of the ring rust. And now I just got to think in front of that live crowd, them cheering him on. He's got to get a hold of Charleston Poe. He's got to take him down. He's got to give him that old fashioned Tennessee grind. And I think he's capable of doing it. So you got the line set pretty accurately. I think it's close to a pick em. It's basically close to a pick em. Um, again, I just tend to favor that style of grappling. So, uh, so yeah, give me, give me Zach Hicks to get the job done. I can understand it. I set this one uh, close there for a reason, Cody. So I'll be curious to see how that one plays out and who ends up getting their hand raised. Neither guy is going to surprise me getting the win on Saturday. Next up, we've got Neil taking on Saunders. And this is one where I felt a little bit more confident placing Neil as the favorite. He's sitting at minus 150, plus 120 to come back on Derek Saunders. You know, Logan Neal, I think this is one of those guys that's just a little better than his record suggests. He's three and nine, but his last fight was for a five round title, lost a decision, so went all five. Derek Saunders, on the other hand, uh, this is his first time, I believe, fighting for the organization, just switched gyms. He's a military guy. Cody, <laughs> I made a couple jokes about this one, and uh, not to upset anybody, but you and I have uh, both talked about the Alaska FC scene where a lot of fighters tend to come from Alaska and the level of competition just is not there. Every once in a while, we'll get a gym out of that organization, but more often than not, it's not that tough to run through your opponents up there. So I question the caliber of opponents that Derek Saunders was fighting before making this hop here. He does have a bit of stick, stiff striking he has some odd knockout power, so we talked about that puncher's chance before. He's got a way to win this fight, absolutely. But if you're going to give me somebody with more credible record, you're going to give me somebody with the five-round experience, I'm going to go with Logan Neal. I think he deserves to be the favorite here in this spot, so I lined him as such. All right, moving on down the card, our next fight, Avamari taking on uh, Damon Gaskin for the next one here. Mai is the minus 185 favorite Damon Gaskin. The plus 150 underdog, another spot where I felt comfortable with the guy who's got the pro experience here. One and oh, as a pro as Ivan Mai, and then you've got Damon Gaskin making his professional debut. He's two, two and six as an amateur. Um, I've had a little bit of experience here for Avamai. I actually did the line for his professional debut. Uh, he did go ahead and get the win there via split decision, so struggled a little bit with that wrestling, but, you know, young kid working his way up, improving his skill set, BJJ purple belt. You've got Damon, who's never been finished. This guy is tough as nails. Apparently, he's a uh, current Marine and just one of these ripped-up powerhouse, absolutely jacked and shredded types. The big thing here, Cody, is that I don't see... Gaskin taking his first finish loss in this fight. So I've got the overset pretty solidly. I think Abamai should probably be the more well-rounded fighter here. I think he will have a path to victory pretty much any way that he chooses in this spot. It's just a matter of avoiding that man strength, that big power shot, that big death punch from Damon Gaskin. So got Abamai favored relatively solidly. I do think that he should be winning this fight more often than not, but you can't count out a guy like Gaskin. How do you see this one playing out? 
Yeah, I got Mahi, and I'm just kind of a little surprised that maybe he wasn't a bigger favorite. I know Mahi's 185, he's young, he's 24, he's only got one pro fight to his record, but this is the kind of thing that on you know a big public book, guys would probably just steam up to minus 600 anyways. For the simple fact that he's a young, good-looking kid, I think he was 7-1 as an amateur, he's 1-0 as a pro, he just got that pro debut out of his way, well, he went... Uh, all five, he went all three rounds, five minute rounds for the first time. It's different from, from amateur to pro. And I just think he's got like a, a bright future. He talks a great game. He's brash. He's out of a very good gym locally in the area. And the sky seems like it's the limit for him. Damian Gaskin, it's no disrespect to him, but the last time the man got his hand raised in victory was in 2016. So six years ago when he beat a three and seven Joe Gibson. Since then, I mean, he dabbles in a little bit here and there. Sure, he's durable. He's there for a young fighter to get rounds against. He'll go out there and he'll probably last all three rounds. I see you got the over two and a half set at minus 300. I completely agree. I think he's going to last the decision. I just don't know where he threats, threatens Mai. Now, Mai did come off a split decision win in his pro debut. So there is that sense of, well, he's not indestructible. But again, in his pro debut, he was taking on a guy that was six and two as an amateur and just seemed like a, a little bit more well-rounded. I think his coaching staff, I think his manager, I think everyone realized Realized, okay, he's good, but let's slow build him along. And so now you got Damian Gaskin, who generally just shows up to give guys rounds. So that's kind of all I see out of this one. If I could specifically bet it money by decision to improve that minus 185, I would probably look to do that. But at less than two to one, I understand it's the Tennessee regional scene. You know, maybe expect the unexpected, but... Uh, but I, I like what I've seen out of Mai so far as an amateur and as a pro, and I would uh, ha have to ride with him here. Okay, I like it. We're definitely agreeing there on the favorite. And your first fight of the evening, kicking things off, I believe 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for this fight card, is Antoine Curtis taking on Kyle Lee. And we've got this fight set at a pick -em. I'll be honest, Cody, every once in a while when you run into a fight, you just kind of shrug your shoulders and I go, you know what? You figure it out. <laughs> the uh, bookies are going to manage the risk. You know, when bets come in and they want to move the lines, I'll let the locals figure out where this line should be. I think these guys are very evenly matched. Anton Curtis is 0-0. Kyle Lee, 0 and one so dropped his UFC debut. Curtis is a 38-year-old kickboxer, whereas uh, Kyle is a 35-year-old, I guess... I think he's kind of more well-rounded, so I kind of want to call him a wrestler, but he's got a well-rounded skill set here. Uh, what you've got in Antoine Curtis, though, is a guy who's got a lot of amateur kickboxing fights. He's definitely going to want to stand. All of his fights ended via finish, so he's coming out here. He's going to be expecting to get this thing done. I did set the total heavy on the under here, just the way these guys fight. I do expect that it probably finishes sooner than later. Grappler versus striker. Whoever goes out there and implements their game plan, probably going to be the guy that gets it done. That's going to be an absolute banger to start off the fight night for everybody. So, hey, if you want to watch these fights, make sure you check out Spectation Sports. That's where all the action is going to be hosted. We'll have links in the description, uh, you know, codes, things like that. You can use code DIEHARD for a 20% discount if you want to sign up over at Spectation sports and of course there's going to be betting odds out for these things if you want to put some money down join cody throw some cash around enjoy watching these fights here on saturday again 7 p.m eastern standard time on saturday the 13th coming up here this weekend cody thank you so much for joining me to do this breakdown preview for the folks and uh hey good luck on saturday